What's up, everybody? We have 10 minutes here. It's just Mark and myself, Jimmy, here on the mic, and uh, we are going to talk about parallax. Parallax is a topic that's come up in many of our podcasts. In fact, if you go back and you look at some of them, or if you've listened to every single one, first off, thanks. Um, But this may be something you've already uh, heard a lot about, maybe you know a lot about it, but we wanted to make sure that we had, if somebody's out there searching specifically for something on parallax, we had that episode queued up and ready for you. So, I think a lot of what we'll do is sticking to parallax in terms of rifle scopes, um, but really actually parallax in and of itself is kind of a, it's just one singular concept. It's just played out or manifested or seen in different ways with different sighting systems. So um, anyway, basically, first off, what you're going to have is when you have a rifle scope, uh, you may have a rifle scope that is just straight up fixed parallax. We have one of these in front of us here. It's our old Diamondback Tactical 3 to 9. Uh, and it doesn't have, it just has two knobs on the, uh, turret saddle or the middle of the rifle scope, one sticking up and one sticking out to the right. That's your elevation and windage. Um, and then there's no knob or, uh, knurled ring up on the objective bell. There's no knob sticking off to the left side. Um, nothing like that. So this is actually a fixed parallax scope. Generally speaking, you'll see a lot of them fixed at a hundred yards. Um, some rimfire scopes may be fixed at 50 yards, um, you know, other stuff like that. But anyway, that's that's kind of how that works, and we'll get into what that means. Uh, otherwise, you may see other scopes like this Razor Gen 2 here in front of us as well. It has a knob sticking off to the left side. Actually, it has two. One of them is the illumination, but uh, one of them uh, here, the larger one, is the parallax adjustment. Sometimes it might be up on your objective bell, too, if you have what's called an AO, adjustable objective. The parallax is adjusted up there. Now, both those are going to be marked with, with numbers, right? That kind of, mm-hmm. uh, you know, correspond with where that parallax will be, you know, optimally set. But that's more of a, a guide than anything else, right, Jim? It is, yeah. There's going to be tolerances within that that have to be achieved, and, and there may even be certain differences in between each rifle scope and stuff. So um, you use the numbers on there. Uh, they are referring to yardage uh, as a general guideline. You get it close, close enough. And then from there, you can either fine-tune it. We'll even maybe go into a little bit of how you can fine-tune it. Or, uh, generally speaking, uh, when you're close enough um, and you've drastically minimized parallax error, then you should be in good shape to even just uh, take a shot in general as well. So um, Definitely. I mean, I was, I was using a, a prototype scope the other day, Jim, that actually didn't even have any number right. markings on it and was able to successfully eliminate the parallax just by, you know... Right. So, um, one thing that we should point out that yardage. So for somebody who is more of a beginner, I've seen at times and, uh, Mark, I know you have a story about this. Some people think that that is actually how you dial your elevation or how you account for bullet drop. Oh boy. It's not, uh, it's not actually adjusting your reticles point of aim at all. Um, you know, it may say, it may go down to like in the case of this gen two razor here, it goes down to 25 yards. So that's really great if you're doing a close up shot and then it goes out eventually to, uh, infinity. But yeah, keep in mind, that's not going to adjust your point of aim at all. It won't actually account for bullet drops. So if you're going to shoot at 100 yards and then 300 yards, uh, yes, you should dial your parallax to the 300 mark, but you also got to do your dialing on your elevation or a holdover still on your reticle from there. Um, They will eventually go up to infinity and uh, we'll get kind of into infinity and and beyond. Um, (laughs) But anyway, so uh, generally speaking, what happens inside of your rifle scope though? We consulted the optical engineers as well on this, but uh, but um, what happens inside your rifle scope is, and this is something that you might have heard in other podcasts that we've done, you have an image that enters in through the objective bell, and when that image enters in, it's going to get focused down onto the first focal plane. It just kind of makes sense, right? So the first plane in which that image is focused down onto is the first focal plane. If your reticle is in the first focal plane, then as you, you know, adjust this parallax knob, it's actually going to adjust where inside that scope physically the image is being focused down onto in the first focal plane. And the idea is that to eliminate parallax error, which probably need to get into a little bit more, but um, is uh, you want the image of the reticle or the physical reticle to be on the same plane in the same spot as where the image is focused down onto. Uh, And from there, then you've eliminated any potential uh, error. And the same thing actually happens back in the second focal plane. So the first focal plane kind of being up underneath the turret saddle approximately, and the second focal plane being back underneath the mag ring approximately. The same thing's actually happening there. So as you're adjusting the parallax knob, it is actually moving where that image is being focused down onto in both the first and second focal plane. 
But the reticle is the only physical thing. Yes, and it doesn't move. It's and it doesn't fixed. move. You know, it, it moves around, you know, up, down, left, right for your windage and elevation adjustments, Does it? but it doesn't move fore and aft. Right. So the thing, the reticle will be fixed. The thing you're trying to move, depending on what distance you're looking at, is where the image is being focused. So an image that's being, you know, looked at that's a thousand yards away will have a different parallax setting or a different setting where you'll want to have the image being focused down onto than the image of something that's a hundred yards away. Um, and that just has to do with the way that light is being reflected off that object, coming into your objective bell, being focused down. Uh, light coming off of objects that's closer to you is less parallel. It may come in at more of an angle, whereas light coming from an object that's really, really, really far away will essentially be, those rays will essentially be parallel with the uh, with the rifle scope by the time they uh, by the time they reach the objective bell, so that's kind of what happens there and why there are some differences. To talk about parallax error, though, this is one thing Mark, you and I were talking about a little bit before. I got a, I got an eyebrow raised from you here, but um, some people may say I've never really noticed parallax before. I can almost guarantee you that you have. Um, so one thing that I'll uh, point out right off the bat is. Uh, have you ever had to have somebody say, hey, look at that over there, and you have to move to get around something in order to look at it over there, right? So let's say you're standing to my right, Mark. If I was going to want to look over at the other end of this room, there's a big sound booth in my way, right? Mm -hmm. Now, from what, where you're standing, a different position, you can see the end of the room, but I can't. Right. So that's essentially sort of like a parallax error because if I move, now I can see around that, uh, you know, the, the position of that sound booth that's blocking me sort mm -hmm. of moves, and then I can see what you're looking at. Um, likewise, if you ever shot a pistol with iron sights, you know that there's such thing as parallax error, which can occur, because uh, let's, say, let's say we eliminate the hand holding of pistols altogether, um, and you just lock a pistol down in place, and you get perfectly centered up behind that pistol, and you look through the rear sight to the front sight and then to the image uh, beyond it, those images of those sites and the image beyond it are on different planes. And so you may see, okay, I'm going to get centered up right behind it. Gun is perfectly pointed at the target, you know, and I see that by the iron sights. Well, now try moving your head off to the left or to the right or up or down. The sights look like they're pointed in a completely different direction, but the gun hasn't physically moved at all. So if you were to have your head in a different position and then try and get the iron sights aimed at the target... You're aiming based off of an error. That's a parallax error. Yep. And so you would then go into pointing the gun somewhere else until you saw, okay, now it looks like the sights are lined up. But again, because of parallax error, you actually pointed the gun in a different direction that's not going to hit the target. Um, the old speedometer analogy is always a good one, too, I feel, Jim, where if somebody is sitting, you know, maybe you're directly behind the speedometer and somebody is sitting, uh, you know, riding shotgun, and they're like, hey, dude, you're going slow. That yeah. person is actually experiencing parallax error because you're actually not going slow. Right. You're, or where you where you can actually tell where the speedometer needle is accurately pegged. Right. They're, they're seeing they're, where it's not accurately pegged. It happens with my wife all the time. Always, always just makes me gun it, and then she gets mad again. And so. you hate going fast. True. Not. But uh, anyway... So that's what we're trying to eliminate. We don't want to have parallax error when we're trying to make our shot. If our image and our reticle are on different focal planes, um, then or they're not focusing on the same focal plane, all that stuff, then if our head isn't perfectly behind the rifle scope, we may have an error. We may experience an error, and it may cause us to point our barrel in order to account for what we see uh, in a wrong direction. And then that could cause us to miss or not hit where we wanted to hit. And uh, so that's kind of what we're trying to avoid. Now, because, let's say somebody sees this rifle scope here that we were talking about earlier, which has a fixed parallax at, say, 100 yards, we've shot this exact scope out to 1,000 yards, and we had impacts, multiple impacts. Mm -hmm. You can still be accurate at different distances with a scope that's fixed parallax, or let's say you somehow forget, whatever, you can still be accurate. That's just where it comes into play of having a good cheek weld, consistent cheek weld, mm -hmm. right behind the optic, right in line with the optical system. Um, and a cheek weld that doesn't move around. You're not, sometimes I'm, I'm choked up a little bit. Sometimes I'm way back. Yep. Sometimes I'm up. Sometimes I'm off. That's where having a really good stock or a cheek riser, like a Bradley cheek rest, for example, is one that we use a lot, comes into play. Anything that can keep you consistent every time you put your face down, it's in the same spot. Yep. Because much like a pistol, again, 
if you go in and you always have that pistol drawn at the same spot, same way, every single time, and you're right behind it, then you don't have to worry about those, you know, your head being off mm-hmm. to one side and lining up the irons in the wrong way. The nice thing I'd say about being able to adjust for it, though, is depending on the scenario or the timing or how rapidly a situation is situation is developing, whether you're hunting or something like that, um, you're not always in, able to get into that optimal position. Mm-hmm. So that's where it's nice to be able to adjust for it. Oh, absolutely, yeah. And you were talking about when you were sighting in. You know, when you sight in, you want to make sure a lot of times places that we sight in are not always putting us in the same position that we'd actually be in when we're normally taking a shot, especially hunters, I would say. Well, mm-hmm. I shouldn't even say that because I know I see a lot of times the PRS or the competitive guys, they shoot in really compromised, strange positions. So actually, really, mm. many, many people uh, wind up sighting in on a bench or, you know, whatever, in a nice uh, prone position where everything is flat, you know. You're able to get super stable mm-hmm. and be super, I guess, you know, accurate with your... Uh, Which you should be. Uh, but not necessarily, it's not always maybe the most natural position, I guess. Or the, or the most practical position the when most... it actually comes down to it. Because, right. So anyway, but when you're sighting in, you definitely want to make sure that you get your parallax set in such a way. And again, like Mark said, no parallax knob is ever going to be absolutely 100% perfect. You will want to do some fine tuning. And you can fine tune it, as we said we'd talk about a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can fine tune it by basically getting behind the scope, adjusting that parallax knob or or dial that you have on the front objective lens um, until when you move your head slightly behind the scope, and we're not talking about like some big exaggerated like movement. It's just little movements, so you're still in the eye box. Mm-hmm. You can still see the image. With the rifle essentially held completely stationary yes. on target, and I guess uh, optimally, like, you're not even touching it at this point. You're not touching it, and ideally the reticle is pointed on a spot, one specific spot that's high contrast that you can see really well. Uh, if you move your head around a little bit behind that and you see that it almost looks like the reticle, even though you're not adjusting any turrets or anything, the reticle kind of dances around that spot, that's parallax error coming into play. It's that whole pistol sight, you know, the irons aren't, they move around just as you move your head even though the gun isn't moving. That's what's coming into play. And you can tune that out very slightly. You can make a small adjustment one way, see if it got worse, if it got better, make a small adjustment the other way if it got worse. And uh, until when you move your head around, you don't see the reticle in um, relative to the point it's on in uh, in space downrange moving around. Yep. Yep, and that just really, really fine tunes it. You know, maybe in a in a in a, you know certain scenarios, you're gonna get it real close. You know, but for that side and process, you know, being able to remove as much as you can is is really nice and gives you a high level of confidence. Mm -hmm. And it can even prevent you from thinking you got yourself a bad rifle or a bad set of mounts or a bad scope, whatever. I've seen plenty Mm -hmm. of people where they're thinking to themselves, this gun should shoot sub minute. And it's like, well, what's the parallax set to? 500. Oops. Um, I've seen it many, many times or Mm -hmm. 25, you know, whatever it is. So uh, that's kind of parallax in a bit of a nutshell for you uh, on rifle scopes in particular. And um, there is Red Dots. We actually did a podcast with Rob Morrell on are Red Dots truly parallax free? So that's an interesting topic because they're actually not. And you wind up going into a number of different things as to how the reticle or red dot in a red dot or holographic site is actually made and projected. And it's almost like it's actually being projected or painted onto your target down range at 50 yards. And then you go into a little bit of what I was talking about with your positioning. Like, you know, if you're looking at something that's 50 yards away and you move around physically. Anyway, it's, it's a real interesting subject. You may want to go back and check that one out as well. But, uh, but parallax is, it's a paradox for some people, I would say. It, so. is, it is. It seems complex, but I'd say identifying it is pretty easy. And also accounting for it is pretty easy. Mm-hmm. Speaking of like things that are a bit of a paradox, we got to do one of these on Mirage. I know we talked with Tony a little bit about it in oh our sniper gosh. podcast. But I got bit by it the other day. We got to do something about Mirage. It's a very it just these optical illusion things, pretty amazing. So, all right, uh, thanks as usual for listening, everybody, and and throw out even sometimes we throw out our own topics that we would suggest. Yeah, um, but throw out other topics that you'd like to hear, and let us know if you have any questions on stuff related to parallax as well. Okay, thanks everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye.